Hello and welcome to another Piper Pod. Today we're going to focus on the special sensors. This one will be focusing on the special sensors that utilize chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors. So let's start by just defining what the special sensors are and what sensors are themselves. So there's a huge variety of sensory receptors throughout the body and it's, all it means is they're specialized cells or structures of cells that can detect a certain stimulus. Now the important, important thing is, is each receptor is specifically designed to react or be stimulated by a particular type of stimulus. Okay, because so you can't get mechanoreceptors uh, activating to chemical responses and vice versa. So they must be triggered by a particular stimulus. The important thing to note is each type of receptor that we'll talk about all result somehow in an action potential. And it's that action potential that triggers a nerve impulse. And obviously the nerve impulse is what triggers your actual neural response. So from your sensory neuron right through to your central nervous system in order to elicit some form of response. Every single receptor works the same way. Now, the way to classify different receptors is you can classify them like top by type, like I have, and we will. You can also classify them by certain locations, whether they're ectoreceptors or interoceptors, so what uh, picks up stimulus from the outside or the inside of the body. But they can also be classified by their structural complexity. So your general sensors or your special sensors. Now general sensors refer to those that are simple. Okay, simple and pretty much found throughout the body uh, and, and work on a very linear fashion. Okay, so your temperature, pressure and pain receptors of your skin, they're what's known as general receptors. Now whilst they are thermo, baro and nosea receptors and they're also found throughout the body, they're still classified as your general side of the house. So general sensors can be an extension of your spinal nerves. Okay, now, certain general receptors can be uh, found within your cranial nerves. If you think about the sensory side of the house for your cranial nerves, then they're known as your general sensors. But when we start looking at special sensors, some of them can be classified as neurons, other ones are specialized protein formations that stimulate neurons afterwards okay so they're what's known as special receptors okay and there's five of them and they're your smell which is chemoreceptor taste sight which is a very special photoreceptor which we'll be spending the entire part two talking about and then your hearing and equilibrium which are your mechanoreceptors okay and they're only uh, controlled if you will or only utilize cranial nerves in order to pass their information on okay so let's get into talking about these special sensors. When we talk about sensation and we talk about um, eliciting some sort of understanding from those sensations, we need to understand a few terminologies that I'll use throughout the lesson so then you don't get lost. So when I say the term sensation, I'm talking about those receptors that are being stimulated. Okay, so somehow those receptors are being turned on by a sensation. When I use the word perception, perception is the interpretation of the sensation that happens in the central nervous system. So if you smell something, the smelling of something is the sensation, but you understanding that what you're smelling is a freshly cooked pie, that's the perception. And it's based on memory, it's based on experience, and it's based on analysis of the central nervous system. So that's the difference between sensation and perception. Now when I use the term adaptation, I'm referring to the fact that your sensory or sensation side of the house can adapt to a repetitive stimulus. Okay, so when I talk about a nerve adapting to a situation, I don't mean that it's learning. I'm referring to the fact that it is ignoring or getting used to a particular um, stimulus, therefore reducing the overall sensitivity towards that stimulus. That's what adaptation means in this sense. So let's get 
started right onto it and we'll talk about taste. Now taste is obviously controlled by your tongue. Now your tongue is set up in pretty uh, unique formation and you'll find taste buds pretty much throughout. So when you're looking at your tongue, your larger front is filled with specialized um, cellular formations called papillae. Now each one of those are either called a filiform or fungiform papillae, and they're found in the front part of your tongue. As you move back to the posterior aspect, then you get your valet papillae themselves. Now each one of these have their own specific taste buds within it. Surrounding the tongue, we obviously have salivary glands that are very important, and then our tonsils. Now your taste buds can be found in the, uh, obviously on the top of your tongue, that's very obvious, It'll also be found in the sides, uh, in your cheeks, in your pharynx, and all the way back in your epiglottis as well, you can find these taste buds. And each one of them are controlled by a different cranial nerve. Now, the important thing to know about how taste works is, first of all, the food that you eat in order to be recognized by your tongue or by your taste buds needs to be dissolved with saliva. So if you were to conduct this little experiment, I know I don't do experiments very often, but this is a nice easy one. Next time you're about to eat something or around, around sugar, just get a paper towel and dry the surface of your tongue first. So your tongue's nice and dry, no saliva, and put the sugar or something else that you know the taste of on the edge of the tongue. What should happen in the absence of saliva is you actually won't be able to taste anything at all. Okay, so before the chemical can be stimulated, it must be dissolved in the saliva itself, meaning saliva is absolutely vital to your taste sensors themselves. Now when we look closer at the taste buds, okay, we'll see the different formations that we have. So we've got the valet, the fungiform, and the filiform papula. You'll see that there is a whole bunch of grooves and quite ugly looking cellular structures when you look really close into it. But the only thing that's exposed on the outside of your actual tongue is your gustatory hairs, okay, within what's known as your as your taste bud pores. So each one of them has a divot or an extension for the chemical to fall into, and from there it can stimulate the hairs itself. Okay, now underneath those hairs we have two specialized cellular structures that are connected to the sensory neuron. So your first one is your gustatory receptor cell. Okay, now they're obviously the one that are going to pass on the neural impulse. We'll talk about how each one of them works a little bit later, but it's a gustatory cell that passes on that action potential. Now your basal cells are specialized uh, stem cells that are in the background because you burn through a lot of your taste buds. Okay, you can actually do a little bit of an experiment if you want. It's completely up to you. You can sort of get your fingernail and scrape it over the top of your tongue. Doing that, you'll actually remove a bunch of these gustatory hairs that you'll find in your tongue. But then within seven to 10 days, your basal cells will become gustatory receptor cells and the whole thing replaces. And it happens every week. Every week you just continue to upgrade and change your taste buds themselves. Okay, so your taste buds themselves do not have any memory whatsoever. Each taste bud is obviously detected to pick up different stimulus. Now, I think this is common knowledge, but you never know out there. The whole map of the tongue that told us where certain things were tasted has been full of shit for about 30 years, okay, from the last time I read. So it's not actually the taste. Uh, it's not actually the case. Huh. Each taste bud is responsible for um, interpreting two or more different types of taste. Okay, so unlike having clusters of areas that can only taste one thing, it's pretty much like a mixed pattern or a mixed formation all over the tongue of different receptor cells that can pick up two or more of the tastes. Okay, so there's some taste buds that can do all five, but the minimal amount is they can do two. Now the five tastes that we have is obviously we have sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami, which is I always found interesting because it basically means, you know, it's Japanese for tasty. That's it. Okay, so 
I'm not sure why they use that. What they should have used is something like um, savoury, all that sort of thing, because that's basically what it's talking about. It's talking about the glutamate f- flavours that, that, that you have, which are quite um, tasty and wintry, if you will. Okay, So each one of these tastes obviously elicit a separate response. So the way the action potential works is each one of these chemicals, in their own unique way, will actually trigger an action potential. Now just to give you some example, obviously sweet is associated with sugar. So the sugar or the, or the glucose within the sweet will actually activate a C-reactive protein to stimulate the opening of sodium channels. Nice and easy. The sour is associated with hydrogen ions. So when that moves in there, the hydrogen ions elicit the same action potential. And so on and so forth. Each one of them elicit a different action potential and a lot of them have a different branch of from each one of those gustatory hairs that we talked about. So they'll stimulate a particular gustatory hair which will travel down a particular pathway and will stimulate the gustatory cells to the sensory nerve. Now the way taste works initially is each one of these passes on one action potential. So if you imagine, obviously when we eat things, it's a mixture of all the flavours. And in order for our brain to interpret what it is, it obviously involves a lot of different parts of the brain besides just this tongue side of the house. So, but from the tongue, each action potential that's coming from a different branch of the gustatory hairs are all sent together. And as they're all sent, they all get passed on via different neurotransmitters different accessory nerves in order to be interpreted by the brain. So once we get to the brain, then obviously all those messages combine. So from the actual taste sensations, we utilize mostly two, but we can use up to three different cranial nerves in order to interpret what's going on. So the facial nerve is responsible for the first two thirds of the tongue. Okay, now a lot of people think that the hypoglossal nerve is associated with tongue itself, okay? But it's not associated with the special senses of the tongue in taste. What it does, it does have a sensory function associated with your thermo, your mechanico, and your uh, nosocomial receptors, so pain receptors within your, in your t- tongue and mouth. They're taken care of by your hypoglossal, okay? Just to let you know. So your facial nerve and your glossopharyngeal nerve are the nerves that actually pass on the sensation from taste to your tongue. Your vagal nerve plays a role in the external uh, taste buds, in your, in your epiglottis and your pharynx. But either way, each one of these impulses are passed from the sensory nerve to the medulla. From the medulla, they meet a series of different synapses that pass it on to the thalamus. Now, the thalamus, if we all remember, is pretty much the control center of the brain. So once it gets to the thalamus, it has a series of synapses that it can pass on, and then it moves it to the gustatory cortex found in the insular lobe, and then it also moves it to the hypothalamus within the limbic system. Okay, so the hypothalamus they will then pass it on to your hippocampus, and that's where we get a lot of our emotional response associated with eating. Okay, but On top of this, as you will learn, the sensation of taste obviously has a much stronger role in smell, memories, and things like that. It's not just as simple as passing on sensations from the tongue. So from there, as I just alluded to, we have a lot of different things that can trigger as a result of this taste reflex. So certain foods, uh, particularly anything that's strong in acids and things like that will produce a large amount of saliva, okay? All foods will start a large amount of saliva, which essentially will start the breakdown. Now, when we eat things and we assess it some form of taste, 80% of what we're tasting is also a co-stimulation from our olfactory nerve that we'll talk about next. So a lot of the time, it's a mixture of information coming from our tongue and our nose, interpreted by a brain that gives us that overall sensation of taste. And then obviously it's our memory cortexes uh, that gives us that emotional response associated with food. Okay, from uh, there, there's a couple of other things that can alter the sensation of taste itself. 
Uh, we have a lot of times people will mention that it's not the taste of food, it's actually the texture. Okay, so the texture sensation, which is picked up not by the, the specialized cells, but the associated cells around the actual mouth, will determine usually a very strong emotional response. So if you were to be given a hamburger, and the hamburger comes out completely drenched and soggy, it's not going to taste as good, even though chemically, it's the same. Your emotional connection to eating a soggy burger is nowhere near as strong. So therefore it will elicit a, a negative emotion from there, even though the chemicals picked up from your tongue are identical. Okay, so the bottom line is before I get too far into it when we start talking in the next three hours about taste um, sensations is a lot of these things with special senses are co-supportive and extremely complex in nature and often involve an emotional attachment or emotional stimulus as well. Okay, from there we'll move on from the mouth to talk about the second chemoreceptors, which is our um, olfactory. Okay, so olfaction is a process of smelling. It's far more uh, sensitive compared to the tongue, the tongue essentially having five we don't actually know how many different receptor sites are found within the olfactory side of the house, but we know that the humans can distinguish around 10,000 different chemicals. It works in a similar way, as in it's a chemoreceptor, and like your taste, as you move up in age, you essentially lose your sense of smell and you'll lose your taste as well. So a lot of old people, as you may know, uh, lose the sense of smell around them, and they tend to have a disinterest in eating things or used to have something that is highly seasoned in order to be able to taste something. So that, that sort of thing happens with, with age. Now, olfactory adaptation is something that occurs pretty quickly. Okay, now the best way for civvies to understand that is when you put perfume or, or deodorant on, it doesn't take long before you yourself can no longer smell that particular perfume because it's the same stimulus being hit a number of times. So olfactory adaptation occurs. The same thing occurs when we go field and we end up reeking. Okay, and we've all had that phenomenon where everybody around you stinks of field but no one can smell it until somebody goes away for a shower or someone fresh moves into the field. And then all of a sudden we realize how good they smell and how horribly we smell at the same time. So that's olfactory adaptation at its best. When we look at the olfactory epithelials, we have a base plate of olfactory hairs that sit just beneath our cribriform plate, okay, right there in the ethmoid bone at the back. So once that is triggered by a chemical response, we often have a, even if we mean it or not, we often have a need or a, re a reflex in breathing in deeper, therefore bringing more chemicals to that actual bed itself. Now like the taste buds, the chemical signal needs to be dissolved within the mucus layer. Okay, so if you're incredibly dry and there is no mucus layer, you actually won't smell any anything at all. Same true is if you are extremely congested and therefore there is a lot of mucus in there, the chemicals won't be able to diffuse through in order to get to the olfactory hair. Okay, pretty, pretty simple. Okay, now from there, that chemical signal that attaches to the end of the olfactory hair will el elicit a change in action potential, uh, sorry, in membrane potential, and then all of a sudden you'll get an action potential which passes the message on to the olfactory bulb itself that sits just above. Now once we get to the olfactory bulb, this is where a lot of the co-swapping um, or the accessory uh, transfers occur. So the entire smell and entire analysis of the smell will actually go from the olfactory bulb and then pass through a number of different areas within the brain. Okay, so through synapse control, it will pass to the collateral sides um, of, of the brain, but then it will also move to the thalamus for interpretation to be passed on, and then it will move to an area known as the prior form cortex, 
Now within the piriform cortex, this is where it decides what sort of specialized areas it needs to move it on to. Okay, so it can move it on to places like the amygdala, like the hippocampus as well. So a lot of the times when we smell something, we rely a lot on memory in order for us to determine what that smell is. And even though it, even if it's not perfect, we never smelled it before, we draw back on smells that we've had in the past. Now if it's a smell that we don't like or we consider a threat, that is why it passes it on to those amygdala regions, so in order for us to elicit that fight or flight response from there. Okay, so that's how the smell itself works. The olfactory bulb can move right through to the olfactory tubercles uh, without the need of, of any synapse in involvement. Now, that there is purely the interpretation of of smell, or sorry, the delivery of a message for smell. Not necessarily interpretation, that obviously needs synapse involvement, but the delivery of the message straight from the nose to the actual olfactory tubercles is no synapse involved, which is unique to all the other senses. All the other senses involve some form of synaptic pass on to each of them. Okay, so that's how the olfactory information is relayed to the rest of the body. Okay. From there we're going to move from chemoreceptors and we're going to move on to mechanoreceptors. So we're going to talk about the ear itself. So the ear is the housing unit for two different types of sensors. So we have hearing and we have equilibrium. So hearing is interpreted within the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. Now equilibrium, for simplicity at this stage, is interpreted within the cerebellum. Now both of them are caused by mechanoreceptors and they are basically controlled by two different receptors um, within the same organ. Okay, so they have the organ that is attached together, the vestibular and cochlea attached together, and each one of those regions is responsible for each of the two senses. Okay, so I'll just move on from there because it'll be a lot easier to explain once I just start actually telling you all about it. So when we look at the human here, we'll look at the breakdown. So the ear itself, the first two halves, so the external and the middle ear, is associated purely with hearing only. Okay, so the sound waves travel through the pinea, echo through the auditory canal, and then it hits the tympanic membrane. Okay, from there, it obviously passes on the message we'll talk about in more detail. When we look back into the inner ear, okay, the fluid field area of the ear, we look at that's associated with hearing and balance. Okay, so this is where your hearing and equilibrium come into the side of the house. So we'll see the cochlea, the snail shape, and then we see the vestibule and its semicircular canals. So the vestibule and the semicircular canals do your equilibrium, and your cochlea is involved in hearing itself. So looking at hearing in more detail, we know that the sound is passed down from the pinea into your auditory canal. Now from going from a larger surface capture area into a smaller one, it amplifies the sound waves within the actual canal. From there it can bounce onto the tympanic membrane. Once it hits the tympanic membrane, okay, stabilized by a special skeletal muscle, it bounces onto the malleus. Now the malleus itself will then vibrate and vibrate the incus and then the incus will vibrate the stapes. Now when the vibration of the stapes occurs, it passes on that sound wave or that mechanical vibration through what's known as the oval window. Okay, now the oval window will stimulate the movement of fluid within the actual membrane vestibule itself. Okay, so within the actual membrane vestibuli, uh, you'll find a specialized fluid called endolymph. Now endolymph is quite thick fluid and the exterior is surrounded by perilymph which is basically like your CNF. Okay? So from there the vibration of or your pressure waves through your endolymph will travel along your cochlea. Okay? And it will travel all the way along until it is passed through the actual basilar membrane and then it will come back 
So this pressure within the ear will always go out the cochlea, and then one way or another, it will come back in, and then that pressure energy is transferred through to the round window. Okay, so a lot of the things to do with the, with the ear is associated with pressure changes. So we have sound waves coming in, hitting the tympanic membrane, which is transferred into mechanical movement of the ossicles themselves. And that mechanical movement is amplified down into a small oval window, which is then passed on to pressure waves within the endolymph. From there, the pressure waves come out, out of the round window, and is transferred back into force within the middle ear itself. So the middle ear is an air-filled cavity, and the inner ear is a fluid-filled cavity. Okay. As pressure builds up in the middle ear, we have that sensation of valsalva, and it moves down your eustachian tubes. Now, I know it's very naughty because they're not actually called eustachian tubes anymore, but um, I'm old school, so you can look up the new talk term for that. I'm pretty sure it's like uh, internal auditory canal or something like that, or a, or a farrow or auditory canal, but a station tube is, is what it's called, and that's what releases that pressure from there. So that's how the transmission of sound waves occurred, but in order to understand how that is interpreted as sound, we need to move on a little bit further. These pictures are pretty much here for ease. Remember the cochlear itself, this straight blue extension that you're seeing, is actually just that, that snail shell cochlea that is just folded out in order to make it easy, easier to, to understand. Okay, so when we have things that are at our, our high frequency, okay, a very, very high frequency, it will travel a little bit along the way before it hits that basilar membrane. Once it hits the basilar membrane, it passes through and then basically goes back to the round window. Now, if we start you know, decreasing that frequency, so we have a middle versus a low frequency, you'll see that it will actually travel much further along the cochlea before it stimulates the basilar membrane. Now, for all those sounds that we cannot hear, for all those frequencies we cannot hear, still have movement but all it does is it will travel right around the actual cochlea and it will never actually stimulate the basilar membrane itself. So it just keeps traveling around, pressure relieves through the round window, and then that's it. Okay, so that's the term frequency that we're talking about. Now, what distinguishes the sound, as in volume, is not necessarily just the frequency. Okay, obviously, it's a lot easier at, at higher frequencies, but it's the actual repetitive stimulation of that basilar membrane is what distinguishes sound as opposed to our frequency. Okay, so that's the difference. So that's how we can distinguish between different types of frequencies and different types of volumes themselves. So from there, we need to turn this into an action potential, which hasn't actually happened yet. So if we have to look closer at the coronary duct. So looking at the cochlea itself, we'll find an area called the organ of, Col of corti. Now in the organ of corti, we're looking at the cochlear duct. Now that cochlear duct is just what we were looking at before. So right on that basilary membrane, we have what's known as the organ of corti. The organ of corti contains hairs as well. So hair fibers that are stimulated by movement. Now as those as the hair moves from its vertical position, it opens potassium channels. When those potassium channels open, the resting membrane potential changes to the point that an action potential can be elicited. Once the action potential is elicited, it passes it along the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now obviously depending on which of the hairs are stimulated will determine our frequency. And when we start looking at how many times that area is stimulated, that will distinguish our volume as well. And that's what interprets our volume within our brain. Okay, but all that information is passed along the vestibular cochlear nerve, okay? Obviously the cochlear branch of the nerve. And then from there it is interpreted by the brain. So it passes right through into the medulla, 
and initially from the medulla, it goes through synaptic pass, uh, passing on to the midbrain. Now in the midbrain, we have a specialized area called the inferior uh, corniculus. Okay, and that inferior corniculus is what's responsible for our startle reflex. So if we hear a really loud noise, and all of a sudden we get that adrenal response and we turn to face the noise in order to find out what it is, that is all controlled by our inferior corniculus. Okay, but just an interest. From there, it moves into the thalamus, like it always does. Okay, always moves into the thalamus for interpretation, and then it is passed out to the auditory cortex within our temporal lobe in order for us to analyze it. Okay, tap into our memory within our temporal lobe, see if we've understood it before. Obviously, if we're listening to the spoken language like you all are now, we go to the temporal lobe, and then we always go, also go to that Wernicke's region as well in order to understand the language that's being spoken. Okay, but that's the pathways that the auditory side of the house travels. Okay, from there, let's look at the equilibrium. So the equilibrium is actually broken up into two functions. Now, a lot of people understand dynamic equilibrium in the process of looking at the semicircular canals. But static equilibrium is also pretty cool and often done in cooperation uh, in order to distinguish where we are in space. So static equilibrium is taken care of in the vestibule, whereas dynamic equilibrium is what is done when we start talking about those semicircular canals itself. Okay, so we'll start with static equilibrium. Okay, so in an area called the macula, uh, right in the, in the middle of the membrane of the vestibule. So the vestibule is the middle bit of what we know as the vestibular cochlear region. Okay, so we have the cochlear, that we've already spoken about, the vestibule, and then we have the semicircular canals above it. So the vestibule has an area within it called the macula, and that is responsible for sending information to the, where the position of our head is in order to uh, kick in a couple of different cranial nerves in order to support our overall function. Now the breakdown of this vestibule, oh, sorry, this macular area, is we have otolinths on top. Now otolinths are rocks, okay, for lack of a better term. They are calcium crystallized stones that sit right on top of, of this macula. Then we have the membrane, and then we have the hairs connected to this, the cells, which are connected to the vestibular nerve fibers of our cranial nerve eight, okay? So that is the structure as, as it sits. So what happens when we move is the movement of our head actually moves those rocks. So we move our head and the otolinth being heavier, on sitting on top of the membrane will actually move, which will move the fluid which in turn will move the hairs either way. So as we move the hairs, we depolarize. Okay, we get that action potential and it passes on the message. If we continually move our head back and forth, back and forth, we'll actually have what's known as hyperpolarization. Okay, so essentially where the hair's been moved one way and then the other without enough time to uh, react, we can contribute to hyperpolarization. Obviously, if we keep doing it back and forth, back and forth, that's when our body gets confused and we start getting that, that, that dizzy feeling. Okay, but that's how the macula passes on the information. And this is known as static equilibrium. Okay, because it's what happens. You don't have to move your head as much as these pictures are, but every time you rock your head back and forth, look around, anything like that, it is the macula within the vestibule that is controlling us being able to do that without falling dizzy and getting sick. When we start looking at dynamic movements, it's similar principles, but in different areas from there. So the semicircular canals is obviously what takes care of those, and they are filled with endolymph as well, Okay, much like our hearing, obviously. It's filled with the same fluid, it's the same structure. Okay, now, endolymph will be moved around this time, not by sound waves or by vibrations, but actually by the physical kinetic energy transfer from us moving. Now this is what's our dynamic, so it involves a lot of dynamic movement like spinning or 
turning around in a circle really fast, being involved in a constantly moving substance, that will move endothelial lymph. And what happens is we have these specialized capillars that are small membranes um, of Christe, small hair fibers on the inside. Now, as the endolymph moves over the top of this criste, it obviously makes the capilla move, and therefore the, the hair bundle itself moves, and then that hair movement enlists an action potential, which is passed on to the actual uh, vestibular cochlear nerve as well. Okay, so much the same, just one's involved in static, and the other one's involved in our dynamic movement. Now, obviously, as you could imagine, this these two work hand in hand together. It's pretty hard to have a dynamic movement without static involvement. Okay, so the positioning of your head. So, a lot of them work hand in hand together and all the information is passed on together uh, to the brain. So where it goes in the brain is actually pretty damn impressive uh, overall. So from the vestibular cochlear region, it travels down cranial nerve eight. So vestibular cochlear nerve until it reaches um, your nuclei right at your brain stem itself. So within the mandala uh, and, and the pons region of the brain stem, we have a whole bunch of synaptic passovers to different regions. So it moves to vestibular area within your cerebral cortex in order to be able to be sensed and elicit some form of uh, feedback system for motor response. Okay, it is also are passed down to your spinal tract in order to have an immediate stabilizing response uh, within our body. That's essentially what helps us not fall over as, as, as a result. From there, it is moved to our cerebellum in order to be analyzed for context, equilibrium, and balance over the overall dynamic movement. And then it's also moved to the three cranial nerves associated with our external eye movement. Okay, so ocular motor, trochlear, and adducive nerves gets passed to in order for our eyes not to fall into the trap of trying to follow our body around. So it helps us maintain equilibrium for a time period. Okay. On top of that, it passes it to the accessory nerve, which helps you know control and contract our sternocleidal mastoids in order to maintain our head in the erect position so our head doesn't flop and just get moved by gravitational forces. So all these things are happening simultaneously every time we spin around in a circle, basically. Okay, so very, very cool stabilizing and co-stabilizing functions. Okay, so that's it for the start of our special nerves. We've gone through chemical receptors and mechanical receptors. Part two, we'll be looking purely at our photoreceptors. I hope you all got something out of this, and until next time, take care.